On January 18th, 2020, just one month before the COVID lockdowns began, the Danish National Symphony was about to perform for a packed house of 1,800 people. The conductor, Valdemar Johansson, stepped onto the stage to take his place behind the podium, baton in hand. Little did he know that a beautiful yet deadly assassin by the name of Nastasia Folgstedlund, hidden in the rear of the auditorium, trained the sight of her sniper's rifle dead center on Johansson's back. A shot rang out, and Johansson fell to the ground, dead from a single bullet. The crowd gasped in horror. What happened next will shock and surprise you. Here's the audio from the scene of the crime. Welcome to the Genius of Thomas Sowell podcast. I'm your host, Alan Wolin. The song you are listening to is the original James Bond theme song from the 1962 classic, Dr. No. This composition, like James Bond himself, has withstood the test of time and still elicits gasps of delight and amazement from audiences around the world. Dr. No was the first in a series of 25 James Bond movies over a 60-year period. The James Bond saga started in 1962. Maybe it's just a coincidence, but that was the year my personal saga began. That was my birth year. Perhaps that's part of the reason James Bond is so deeply embedded in my psyche. I grew up with Bond. But more about James Bond later. So buckle up. Ever since I announced I was going to have Gad Saad on the podcast, strange things have been happening to me. I'm not a paranoid person, but lately I get the feeling I'm being followed. I've been noticing the same faces at my neighborhood Starbucks, all showing up coincidentally at around the same time I get there. Yesterday, on my morning hike in Griffith Park, I noticed a couple about 500 feet ahead of me on the trail for at least a full mile. I read somewhere they sometimes follow you from in front of you, just so you don't feel like you're being followed. The other day at the pool, a guy I've never seen before gets in my lane and follows me for at least 50 laps. At one point, I let him pass me, but before I knew it, he was right behind me a few minutes later. This is very suspicious behavior, and I'm sure they are trying to send me a message of some sort. So just to be on the safe side, I'm recording this episode from an undisclosed location, 100 miles outside of Los Angeles. I won't say in which direction. I bought some equipment on Amazon, which helps me to sweep the room for bugs. And once I'm sure it's safe to speak freely... I'll be talking at a normal volume. 
You can't be too careful these days. We should be all set now. I just want to say for the record, if this should turn out to be my last episode, I'm a very happy person, and I'm not at all suicidal. Honey, I love you and the kids, and please make sure my Thomas Sowell book collection gets split exactly evenly between our children. I would hate for one of them to feel slighted in any way. I first met Gad Saad at the Stanford Academic Freedom Conference last November. I dedicated a full episode to the conference, and if you haven't already listened to it, you really should. It's one of my favorite episodes. In preparation for today's conversation with Dr. Saad, I read his 2020 book, The Parasitic Mind and also his new book, The Sod Truth About Happiness, which he was kind enough to send me an advanced copy of before it was available to the public. So I feel like I've really gotten to know Gad Saad and to understand his way of thinking and seeing the world. As regular listeners will know, music is a critical component of my podcasting. It sets the tone for everything I create. When I was thinking about which theme music to pair with my Gad Saad interview, the James Bond theme song immediately came to mind. My subconscious works in mysterious ways. So why did James Bond get associated in my brain with Gad Saad? Initially, I wasn't sure. So I started thinking about James Bond and about what he represented for me all these years. I was surprised to discover that James Bond represents four very powerful ideas for me. I'd like to share these four themes with you because I think it will help prepare your mind for Gad Saad and the thrust of his work. James Bond theme number one. The James Bond movies all have the same basic story. There's a very evil man or group of men who are out to take over the world or destroy the world in some way. And there is only one man who can save the world, James Bond. Code number 007. Bond is so special, so talented, and so important that his government has issued him a so-called license to kill. Bond is allowed to kill whoever he needs to kill in his own judgment to accomplish his mission, no questions asked. He's the guy they call when the mission simply must succeed, when failure is not an option. The whole world is counting on James Bond, whether they know it or not. He's working behind the scenes to ensure the survival of civilization as we know it. As a child, then as a teenager, this idea of saving the world like James Bond always resonated with me and inspired me. And the idea that one person can save the world That's a truly revolutionary concept. For me, it meant that I should always act, always speak up, never keep quiet, and never go along to get along. That I don't need the group's permission to take action. I remember an incident as a young boy in summer camp. I must have been only five or six at the time. There was one kid everybody was making fun of because he had some sort of physical disability. I distinctly remember standing back from the group and not participating in teasing that boy. I was the only one. Sometimes speaking up takes the form of keeping quiet. Years later, as a young 20-something living in Manhattan, I witnessed a purse snatcher grab a young woman's bag and take off with it. Immediately, without even thinking, I started to chase the purse snatcher. I wasn't planning to catch him and fight with him, But I stayed right behind him and kept yelling, Drop the bag! in the deepest voice I could muster. After about five blocks, he finally dropped the bag and ran off. He saw I wasn't going to give up the chase. I brought the bag back to the original scene of the crime, and the young woman was still there. I gave her her bag back and expected some sort of gushing, my hero type treatment. Instead, she just said, Thanks. My boyfriend is not going to believe this. Oh well, 
that might have ended differently had I looked more like Daniel Craig. She was shaken, but apparently not stirred. Can I do something for you, Mr. Bond? Uh, just a drink. A martini, shaken, not stirred. For me, James Bond represents the spirit of fearless action for a just cause. It's the spirit of believing that I alone can save the world in my own way. It doesn't matter if I can really save the world. It's about believing I can and just taking action. When people ask me why I started a podcast about the ideas of Thomas Sowell, I always give them the same answer. Because I want to save the world. James Bond theme number two. James Bond is British, very British. That's not a coincidence. We Americans are so used to America being the world's savior, but this is different. We Americans have been brought up on the idea that we had to fight a war to free ourselves from enslavement by the British, that the British were the bad guys and we were the good guys. That's our national story on some level. So when the guy who is saving the world is a Brit, that's a disconnect right there. There's something really important going on here. Do we owe a great debt to Great Britain? Why are all the best places to live in the world former colonies of the Queen? America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. Why do migrants to Europe from Africa, Asia, and the Middle East flood into Europe and try to make their way through Greece, through Italy, through Spain, and through France, in order to end up in England. Is there something special about the British ethos that migrants from all over the world want a piece of? I'll leave you to answer this question for yourself. Speaking of the Queen, Britain maintains the trappings of its centuries-old monarchy to this day. We Americans tend to scoff at the idea of monarchy but that is only because we compare it to democracy and we laugh at how primitive the whole thing sounds. What? The son of the king automatically becomes the new king? How preposterous! But we fail to appreciate what a wonderful invention monarchy was at the time it was invented. Before monarchy, when the king died, competing generals and their armies would fight each other over who would be the next king. And this led to the shedding of much blood and many lives lost. Monarchy was a brilliant solution to the age-old problem of how to transfer power peacefully, and it worked for centuries. This subject reminds me of a passage from Sowell's The Quest for Cosmic Justice about the concept of primogenitor. Sowell said this, Primogeniture, the practice of leaving an estate entirely to the eldest son, is something that most of us today would consider unjust to the other children. Arbitrarily selecting the ruler of a nation by a similar principle would likewise be widely objected to on moral grounds, among other objections to monarchy. The purpose of primogeniture was, of course, to keep an estate intact from generation to generation. The point was not simply to make a given sum of wealth in one individual's hands larger than it would be if the land were shared. The point was to make the total wealth available to the family as a whole larger than it would have been under equal inheritance, where it would have been broken up into smaller and smaller pieces with the succeeding generations, creating economic inefficiencies that reduced the total value of the fragmented estate. Primogeniture relied on family ties and a sense of duty to guide the eldest son in looking out for his younger siblings. Land was often worth more when it could be farmed in one piece than the sum total of smaller separate pieces after being subdivided. There are what economists call economies of scale in production, and these can be lost as land is fragmented over time by being repeatedly divided equally among heirs. The poverty in a number of countries has been attributed to the fact that there are minute land holdings in those countries, with a given farmer often having several of these tiny plots, inherited from different family branches, located at some distance from one another, requiring his working day to be similarly broken up and time lost in transit from one place to another. In short, cosmic justice for heirs can mean unnecessary poverty for society as a whole. This by itself does not necessarily justify primogeniture. It simply says that the costs of achieving justice matter. 
Another way of saying the same thing is that justice at all costs is not justice. What, after all, is an injustice but the arbitrary imposition of a cost, whether economic, psychic, or other, on an innocent person? And if correcting this injustice imposes another arbitrary cost on another innocent person, is that not also an injustice? In the world of today, where most wealth is no longer in land but in financial assets which can be divided among heirs without such high costs, a very different situation exists. But this is not to say that primogeniture, when and where it existed in a different world, was without any rational or moral foundation. For me, this passage serves as a powerful reminder that we should not judge the practices of the past with the values of the present, at least not until we have taken the trouble to understand why our ancestors did things the way they did, and chose between the options which were actually available to them at the time. James Bond, as powerful and important as he was in his own right, served queen and country foremost. The sixth Bond film was even called On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Bond's boss was always codenamed M, who was the chief of the British Secret Intelligence Service, MI6. M was played by a woman, Julie Dench, in Skyfall, the 23rd Bond film. M was somewhat of a maternal figure to Bond, why didn't you call? You didn't get the postcard? You should try it sometime. Get away from it all. It really lends perspective. Ran out of drink where you were, did they? What was it you said? Take the bloody shot. I made a judgment call. You should have trusted me to finish the job. It was the possibility of losing you or the certainty of losing all those other agents. I made the only decision I could, and you know it. I think you lost your nerve. What do you expect? A bloody apology? You know the rules of the game. You've been playing it long enough. We both have. Maybe too long. Speak for yourself. This maternal connection for Bond probably comes from the life experience of Ian Fleming, who wrote the Bond novels. As John Pearson wrote in his book, The Life of Ian Fleming, There is reason for thinking that a more telling lead to the real identity of M lies in the fact that, as a boy, Fleming often called his mother M. While Fleming was young, his mother was certainly one of the few people he was frightened of, and her sternness toward him, her unexplained demands, and her remorseless insistence on success find a curious and constant echo in the way M handles that hard-ridden, hard-killing agent, 007. James Bond theme number three. James Bond is unapologetically masculine. He's good-looking, strong, smart, skillful, a great fighter, and he's tough as nails. Plus, he loves women, and they love him. The opening intro to almost every Bond movie features the silhouettes of naked women walking, flying, or swimming across the screen. These erotic images set the tone for what motivates Bond throughout his movies, his passion for women, and his masculine instinct to protect them at all costs. Every Bond movie has a special woman, and no Bond movie would work without one. There's something about man's love for woman which is crucial to his fighting spirit, and is so perfectly embodied in the character of James Bond. If you ever get a chance to visit Palm Springs, California, I highly recommend that you spend an afternoon at the Palm Springs Air Museum. I've been there about a dozen times, and I can't get enough of that place. I'll put a link in the show notes to their website. The museum is located at the Palm Springs Airport and has a large collection of many of the original warplanes from World War II, the Vietnam, and Korean Wars. 
One of the things I always found interesting about these airplanes is what was painted on the sides of the planes right under the cockpit. It was almost always an illustration of a beautiful woman either wearing a bathing suit or some other sensual outfit. Sometimes she was even posed straddling a bomb, which undoubtedly had phallic connotations to the dashing young pilots. If you know anything about the aerial missions flown during World War II, this was a dangerous business, and so many of the planes got shot down over enemy territory. When you took off from a base in Britain to drop bombs over Germany, there was no guarantee you were ever coming home. These men needed real courage, and for some reason, seeing that beautiful woman painted on their fuselage gave them that extra boost of testosterone just when they needed it most. There is no point in understating this crucial aspect of the James Bond character. His attraction to and his love for women was a crucial component to his fighting spirit. No other action hero has been able to match James Bond in this masculine trait. Not Matt Damon playing Jason Bourne. Not Tom Cruise playing Ethan Hunt in Mission Impossible. Not Liam Neeson playing Brian Mills in Taken. Not Denzel Washington as Robert McCall in The Equalizer. Nope. Nobody comes close to Bond in this department. As Carly Simon sang about Bond in The Spy Who Loved Me, nobody does it better. When this song was released in 1977, I was only 15. And me and my guy friends at the time discussed what exactly was the it that nobody did better than Bond. To this day, I'm still not 100% sure, though I do have a few ideas I won't discuss here. James Bond theme number four. Is it just me, or is there an underlying sadness and loneliness in the James Bond character? In preparing for this episode, I immersed myself in all the James Bond theme songs, and so many of them have a sad and tragic tone. The song you are hearing now is No Time to Die, sung by Billie Eilish. I should have known I'd leave alone Just goes to show That the blood you bleed is just the blood you own As Billie Eilish sings Was I stupid to love you? Was I reckless to help? Was it obvious to everybody else? That I'd fallen for a lie You were never on my side. Fool me once, fool me twice. Are you death or paradise? Now you'll never see me cry. There's just no time to die. Was I stupid to love you? Was I reckless to help? Was it obvious to everybody else that I I can't help but feeling tremendous sadness in the theme from Skyfall, sung by Adele. This is the end Hold your breath and count to ten Feel the earth move and then Hear my heart
And remember when you were young and your heart was an open book? Well, those days are no more. When you were young and your heart was an open book You used to say Then there's the ominous Goldfinger, sung by Shirley Bassey. Mr. Goldfinger, pretty girl, beware of this heart of gold. This heart is cold. A cold finger beckons you to enter his web of sin. But don't go in. Diamonds Are Forever, also sung by Shirley Bassey, has that tragic vision of human nature. Diamonds Are Forever sparkling round my little finger. Unlike men, the diamonds linger. Men are mere mortals who are not worth going to your grave for. Diamonds are forever They are all I need to please me Stimulate and tease me They won't leave in the night I've no fear that they might desert me You Only Live Twice by Nancy Sinatra is also quite sad and implies you can never really live your dream life. You Only Live Twice, or so it seems. One life for yourself and one for your dreams. Then there's Thunderball, sung by Tom Jones. His days of asking are all gone. His fight goes on and on and on. His days of asking are all gone. His fight goes on.
And of course, there's Writings on the Wall, sung by Sam Smith. How do I live? How do I breathe? When you're not here, I'm suffocating. I want to feel love run through my blood. Tell me, is this where I give it all up? How do I breathe when you're not here? I'm suffocating. I want to feel love run through my blood. Tell me, is this where I give it all up? How do I live? How do I breathe when you're not here? I'm suffocating. I want to feel love run through my blood. Much of the James Bond music is sad, lonely, and tragic. For me, it's the musical embodiment of Sowell's tragic vision of human nature. For Sowell, man is a flawed and imperfect creature, and this will never change. And we have to learn to live with the trade-offs inherent in any society composed of such flawed creatures like ourselves. All of Sowell's writings are infused with this tragic vision of human nature. If you share this vision, his work resonates with you. If you don't, it doesn't. That's my theory anyway. So these are the four themes of the James Bond character which always resonated deeply with me. His drive to save the world, his devotion to queen and country, his intense masculine energy, and his tragic hero persona. I think this is why I felt driven to pair my Gadsad interview with the music from James Bond. For me, Gadsad represents these four themes as well. What James Bond was to the physical world, Gadsad is to the intellectual world. While Bond fights to save the world from bad characters, Gadsad fights to save the world from bad ideas. While Bond fights to save the world from those who seek to enslave or destroy us, Gadsad fights to save Western civilization from those who seek to destroy the foundation and basic principles of that civilization. Just as Bond epitomizes the masculine-feminine dichotomy, so too does Gadsad as an evolutionary psychologist embrace and celebrate the differences between men and women, and he champions the union between man and woman as one of the key pillars of a happy life. Finally, only someone who truly understands the tragic side of life would even think of writing a book about happiness. Dr. Saad is a tenured professor of marketing at the Concordia University School of Business in Montreal, Canada. His specialty is the application of the ideas of evolutionary psychology to consumer behavior. He has written papers about how showy products like fast cars affect men's testosterone levels, which in turn affects their risk-taking behavior, and how menstrual hormones affect women's buying decisions. He has written many articles for academic journals and published several books for an academic audience. But all that is just his day job. In his spare time, Gad Saad has been speaking up about cultural issues. He has stepped outside of academia and talked directly to the general public. This is exactly how I first heard of Gad Saad. I think it must have been one of his seven appearances on the Joe Rogan podcast which brought him to my attention. Who is this guy who Joe Rogan the most listened to podcaster in the world, keeps bringing back to his show over and over and over again. He has also been interviewed by Sam Harris, Adam Carolla, and Dave Rubin, all guys I pay some attention to. But I think Gad Saad's official break into the so-called culture wars began with his publication in 2020 
of the parasitic mind, how infectious ideas are killing common sense. Here are some morsels from the parasitic mind. In this clip, Gadsad describes the types of mind viruses he is fighting against. Some of the parasitic viruses of the human mind that I tackle include postmodernism, radical feminism, and social constructivism, all of which largely flourish within one infected ecosystem, the university. While each mind virus constitutes a different strain of lunacy, they are all bound by the full rejection of reality and common sense. Postmodernism rejects the existence of objective truths. Radical feminism scoffs at the idea of innate, biologically based sex differences. And social constructivism posits that the human mind starts off as an empty slate, largely void of biological blueprints. In the next clip, he talks about the dichotomy between reason and emotion and how the two have gotten confused, especially at the university. Nor is it surprising that people differ in the extent to which they rely on feelings versus thinking when making choices. The problem arises when domains that should be reserved for the intellect are hijacked by feelings. This is precisely what plagues our universities. What were once centers of intellectual development have become retreats for the emotionally fragile. The driving motto of the university is no longer the pursuit of truth, but the coddling of hurt feelings. In this final clip, Gad Saad talks about the importance of being judgmental, and he even mentions you-know-who. To never judge is to be an intellectual coward, for it serves as an insurance policy against the possibility of being a polarizing figure. The most charismatic public intellectuals are typically those who share their judgments on a broad range of issues. Thomas Sowell and the late Christopher Hitchens are two of the leading public intellectuals of the past four decades, precisely because they never shied away from sharing their opinions on contentious issues. Of course, not all judgments are created equal. The difference between a judgmental ideologue and a judgmental intellectual is the process by which each arrives at his position. As long as one uses well-articulated arguments in support of one's judgments, it is perfectly acceptable to judge. Dr. Gad said, welcome to the Genius of Thomas Sowell podcast. Uh, it's so nice to be with you. And actually, your uh, behavior in interacting with me is something that I cover in my forthcoming book on the importance of... Uh, did you hear that? Yeah. What was that? Thunder? That's a massive thunder. Yeah. So anyways, it speaks to the power of persistence. So thank you for being persistent. And I'm delighted to be with you. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned that because uh, in your book, you talk about how you got to interview Russell Tompkins Jr., who was the lead yes. singer of the Stylistics. Yes, sir. And you had to be very persistent with a lot of grit to get him on your show. <laughs> and this was uh, egged on by your young daughter, I, I believe. Is that true? Exactly. So do you want me to share sort of the, the denouement of the story? Yeah, please. So basically what happened in 2001, I had moved to California to be a professor at University of California, Irvine. And I had always sort of uh, entertained this fantasy that one day I would be holding a private party in some beautiful garden that I own. And I would be wearing a velvet suit with a bow tie and I would come out and to my esteemed guests. And I would say, ladies and gentlemen, the stylistics, and they would be performing at this private event of mine. And so I had the chutzpah to actually think that a professor would have enough money to invite the stylistics for such a show. So I reached out in 2001 or maybe 2002 to the management team of the stylistics. And then I was quickly disabused of the notion that I could afford them. Fast forward about 15 years later, we're around 2016. I've now built a pretty large platform. I invite all sorts of really interesting people to come and chat with me. And so I reach out to their management team. And in this case, I'm not asking them to come and perform for me, but I'm just trying to have a chat with my childhood musical hero. I try a few times, it doesn't work. Finally, my daughter says, why don't you call them and leave a message? I did, but then they never responded. She kept saying, hey, have you have you called them? Have you called them? And so one day I'm sitting watching a, a soccer match on a Saturday morning. The line, the landline rings, which it almost never does. And there is the caller ID and it says Russell Tompkins Jr. And I, so I already know before I answer who it is. And uh, so I pick up the phone. He goes, hi, I'm trying to reach uh, Professor Saad. I said, speaking. He goes, oh, this is Russell Tompkins Jr. of the style. And, I, and my exact words were, oh, my Lord. We become friends. He comes on my show. Then I go visit him in Philadelphia. I was giving a talk at a 
scientific conference in in um, in Philadelphia. He lives in Philadelphia, so I reached out to him. I said, "Hey, do you want to get together?" And he says, "Name the place and time, and I'll be there." So we end up spending a whole evening together. That's that's the beauty of life, Alan. It really it really is a great lesson in life because you know. I always say, if you're not getting rejected several times a day, then you're not really living on the edge. You know, we, <laughs> we, we, we try so hard to avoid rejection, but we should actually be seeking it. So true. So true. Uh, right. Um, and, you know, you reaching out to them over and over again, of course, you were setting yourself up for rejection after rejection, but, you know, and it's not going to work every time, but it's, it's going to lead to a happier life for sure. Exactly. And, you know, it's, it's tough to do because... I should just mention it's not as though I was, uh, you know, a pest. I, you know, I reached maybe two, three, four times every time, separated by a couple of months. But not, notwithstanding that caveat, you know, you're setting yourself up not only for potential rejection and failure, but also someone like me who can easily be offended by personal slights, maybe to a fault. If you don't answer me, then I'm going to take offense to it. But yet I had to swallow my pride and say, look, maybe this guy is busy. Maybe this guy received a million of these. Who He doesn't know who I am. And so you sort of have to also be humble in recognizing that when people sometimes reject you, it's it's nothing personal. It, it's because they've got busy schedules. And so I'm glad that I had the wisdom of my then eight-year-old daughter to get me through all these obstacles. You know, I had my wife egging me on to get you on the show because, you know, my wife, I t and I told you this, we met at the Stanford Academic Freedom Conference in November of last right. year. And okay, before I talk about my wife, when I first walked into the conference, I saw you sitting there in the first row of tables. And I thought to myself, of course, no conference on academic freedom would be complete without the presence of Gadsat, who more than anyone epitomizes what academic freedom is supposed to be, okay? The second thing I thought was, there's, it's no coincidence that he's in the front row because he's the type of person who has a zest for life, who's gonna participate 100%. You don't wanna miss even the slightest facial expression of one of the speakers. You know, and, you're, and you're also there to learn. You, know, you came to learn, you rolled up your intellectual sleeves and you were there to learn. And there's something you know, in, inspiring about being you know, what I call a front rower, you know, someone who always goes to the front row. And the interesting thing is that the front row seats are usually the easiest to get. They fill up the last. Is that right? Yeah, I've, I've noticed that. I've, a lot of times I walk into a place, I always go right to the front row because I know there's going to be seats there. I don't know why that is, but people are intimidated. People maybe want to hide in the back so that they're not called upon, maybe? For sure. So, but thank you for those lovely words. I really appreciate it. No, and, and, I, and I really mean that. Um, so, you know, your, your presence at the... At, at the conference was it was a real inspiration for me. Oh, and my wife was egging me on to get you on the show because you had awakened her to the idea pathogens that she had been swallowing hook, line, and sinker for many, wow. many years, starting in 2016. And she credits you. Oh, that's that, lovely. That, that wake up moment. You know, and I remember I remember telling you that uh, over at, over the snack table. Yeah, yeah. At the um, the conference, I was enjoying my scone and coffee, and I told you, <laughs> yeah, I have to tell you this. Um, no, that you know, and by the way, that story it, you can't imagine how much uh, how enriching it is for me to hear that because you know people will often ask, you know, why why do you get involved in all this? Why do you do it? Well, it's because I get to hear an incredible story, a, a woman that I've never met that I somehow have been able to hopefully positively influence my God, my, my, the rest of my life is, uh, is bonus. So it's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. And you know, I, I want to talk with you a little bit about that later, later in, in this interview about your call to action in the parasitic mind, but we'll, we'll get to that later. Preparing, you know, for this interview, I read, I studied actually two of your books, The Parasitic Mind, How Infectious Ideas Are Killing Common Sense, and 
thank you for sending me an advanced copy of The Sad Truth About Happiness, Eight Secrets for Leading the Good Life, which is brand new. It's coming out in July, and I recommend that everybody read it. So I was very tickled that you mentioned Thomas Sowell in both of these books. In The Parasitic Mind, you called Sowell, quote, one of the original slayers of social justice warriors back in the 60s and 70s. You complimented him for never shying away from sharing his opinions on contentious issues. In your new book about happiness, you extol Sowell for preaching a message of personal agency and for rejecting the victimhood mentality. In February of 21, you wrote an essay called 10 Reasons Why You Should Love Thomas Sowell. So tell us about your relationship with Sowell and his work. So I first encountered him, not through reading one of his brilliant books, but I, I can't remember the exact genesis, but it was, you know, some YouTube clip from, you know, the 1960s or 70s, where he's taken on some feminist on, you know, I don't know if it was Phil Donahue or, you know, Mike Walls. I, I can't remember which show it must have been. And I was just like somewhat, I mean, not maybe mesmerized, but God damn, who is this guy? And so then you start doing the dig, the, the deep dive and then you discover Thomas Sowell. That would have probably been, I would say, you know, maybe 15 years ago because I had been in my own academic work fighting against a lot of these social constructivists and militant feminists and what I call the flat earthers of the human mind, the folks who reject the idea that biology can influence human behavior, that evolutionary psychology can influence our behavior. And I think it was through, you know, my constant battles with many of my academic colleagues that I stumbled on his work. So it was first YouTube. And then from YouTube, I then started reading some of his work. And as you know, this past summer, I was reading, you know, I always, whenever we go somewhere on a trip, one of my most stressful moments is to decide what is the next book that I'm bringing on the trip. And uh, I was uh, lucky enough to be rational enough to choose Vision of the Anointed Ones for, for, for this past California trip. And then when I read that, I'm like, my goodness, almost every word that he says in there could apply to exactly what we're facing now. So yeah, Thomas, so I, I share your admiration for him. So, you know, how deep have you gotten into his work? Have you read, you know, two or three books? Have you read 10? I mean, you know, where the, are you in that journey? Uh, a full book, only Vision of the Anointed, little snippets from many different books, several articles from his, remember his old ongoing, uh, you know, series that he used to uh, right, do? The columns. the columns, I've read those. But I must say that, uh, how many books has he written? Like 30, maybe? Well, he's got 47 books out. 30, 37 of them, I think, are original books. The other 10 are like collections of essays. Right. So I would say, and this is completely speculative, but out of all his written words, I would be hard pressed to, to imagine that I've read more than 5% of it. But it's it's enough of a percentage to know that he's unbelievable. That's great. That's great. So you've got, you've got a lot more ways to go, which is great. Right. Which actually reminds me of, of why I started this podcast. I was doing a a reading challenge. I was my my goal was to read a book a week for a year, and somewhere in my second year, I was like, you know, I'm I'm getting a lot out of these books. I'm reading some great books, but the the ones I'm really getting the most out of are the Thomas Sowell books. Why don't I just focus only on reading all the Thomas Sowell books? And while I'm at it, why don't I start a podcast to talk about them? <laughs> so that that's where I that, you know that's where I am now. One of the reasons why I have a hard time, I mean, I read also you know, voraciously my entire life, both professionally, you know, right? If I'm writing a book, I have to read a million other books in, as part of the research, but also just for leisure. It's one of the things that I enjoy reading, the, doing the most. But related to a point that I discussed in my forthcoming book, I tend to be a maladaptive perfectionist. So oftentimes my reading speed is slowed down because I get into this kind of OCD where I reread a sentence three times because God forbid, I must have missed one word that I didn't read. I mean, I by the way, I read the end notes of every book. And so I often 
wonder if I were to take up a challenge like yours, or I want to read a book a week, whether I can do it only not due to motivation or, or, or interest, but simply because my punctilious perfectionist nature might not allow me to get through a book in a, in a week. I totally get that. The only reason I was able to do it was because I go on three hour hikes every morning and I was able to listen to the audio books. Ah. And I had the book downloaded on my phone. So if I saw something that I really liked, I could stop and grab the quote and save it. So I, I sort of had both at the same time. Beautiful. But gotcha. uh, those hikes saved me. See reflections on the water More than darkness in the depths See him surface and never a shadow On the wind I feel him You know, in some ways, you remind me of Thomas Sowell, and let me explain why. Both of you are academics who specialize in somewhat technical subjects, and yet you both have chosen to communicate your ideas with the general public in a way which everyday people can relate to. You've mentioned in the past that fellow academics sometimes look down on you for your appearances on Joe Rogan's podcast, for example, and also for your irreverent style of communication. I've heard economists who somewhat look down on Thomas Sowell for, not, they claim, not making any original contributions to the field of economics. And I find these critiques very misplaced. So let me, let me start by asking you this question. You're, you're, you're in the business school. Is there any hard evidence that all the so-called original ideas, which economists win Nobel Prizes for, have contributed to advancing humanity in any way? <laughs> I'm not saying they don't. I'm just asking, is there any evidence that they do? Do you know? So, yeah, no, that's a great question. Uh, so first, uh, I think I could retire now because any time that I am uh, compared in any way to Thomas Sowell is is, uh, is a big day for me. So I think I'm, I might put that quote of yours on my CV. Uh, but so thank you for those words. Uh, I'll answer it in this way. I'll answer it in a, in a somewhat technical way. So one of the things that... Uh, the scientific method expects is what's called replication, right? So if if there is a phenomenon that we can sort of include as part of the core knowledge of the field, it has to hopefully be replicated and validated across different independent teams, all of which then converge to confirming that this finding seems to be veridical, which of course, by the way, even that would be still provisionally true because if in 300 years, someone comes along and falsifies that, well, then we're back to the drawing board. That's what's beautiful about the scientific method. That we're always updating what we consider to be true. And so to the point of replication and in answering your question, maybe in an indirect oblique way, Less than 5% of findings published in the leading business school journals have been replicated. Stop and think about that for a second, right? So, so I can't answer, I mean, well, I, I can answer to the fact of, you know, whether some of the findings have helped society. Of course they have, because many of the things, for example, that you see in the uh, AI algorithms that allow Facebook to understand our behavior and to then predict what we're going to do next better than our brains can predict. That really comes from a lot of people who understand consumer behavior and marketing and big data analytics. So there is an, there's an insurmountable amount of cases that suggest that, of course, we are doing things that are practically relevant and so on, let alone academically relevant. But the fact that only 5% of the edifices of reason that we purport to be teaching our students, only 5% has been replicated, that should make us stop and really think hard about what we're doing. And one of the reasons why, by the way, Alan, I love evolutionary psychology is because usually the findings in evolutionary psychology have an extraordinarily higher replicability rate. Because before you argue that something is a human universal, as is often the case in evolutionary psychology, you have to have demonstrated its veracity across different cultural environments, across time periods, oftentimes across species. And so that which many of the other fields in the business school, let alone the social sciences, they suffer from lack of re replicability. 
That is not something that evolutionary psychology suffers from. When I look at someone like Sowell, he spent years and years figuring out how things work in the real world. Then he spent more years and years teaching what he learned to the, to the general public, including me. And he did that so that people can make better decisions when they vote. In my mind, that's the highest contribution an economist can make to humanity. And, and I did an episode on why he deserves a Nobel Prize just for that. Right. You know? Um, now, if your research into happiness can help people to become happier, isn't that more important than you simply coming up with a bold new theory on happiness that no one ever thought of before? I, I mean, a lot of the ideas in your book are very basic. And yet, if you can communicate them in a way which inspires people to actually use them, isn't that an accomplishment unto itself? I mean, I, I would certainly hope so. And to that point, be, before I answer the happiness point directly, you might remember, and it speaks to your earlier question about how some of my colleagues would look down upon me for appearing on Joe Rogan. I'm guessing you are perhaps referencing the story in chapter one of The Parasitic Mind, where I talk about my going actually to Stanford, although it wasn't on the Stanford trip where you and I met. It was an earlier trip in 2017, where I had been invited to the Stanford Business School. So that's pretty much you know, the mecca of academia, where I had been invited to give a talk on my you know evolutionary consumer psychology work. And the night before, I had uh, gone out to dinner with you know one of my hosts, just one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, during the, the night, he, he said, oh, you know, I, I, I looked you up on Google and so on. I didn't know you were such an academic celebrity. You appear on Joe Rogan and so on. I said, oh, as a matter of fact, I'm probably going to be appearing soon. He, so he kind of looks at me with disdain and says, oh, well, you know, we don't condone that at Stanford. And I said, well, you don't condone what exactly at Stanford? You don't condone appearing in, in front of a, a crowd of maybe 20 million people who are going to download your ideas? He said, well, we don't do research so that it could be sexy enough to appear on Joe Rogan and discuss it there. I said, well, I don't either. I can both do serious research. And if it's worthwhile research, then I would like to think that I could uh, share it with 20 million people. It's not a mutually exclusive thing. So that speaks to your earlier point. So, But now coming back to happiness, you're exactly right. I think that if I can help, uh, I don't know how many people, uh, X number of people have a certain set of guidelines that are likely to increase their chance of being happy, then how do you quantify that? Look, by the way, and this is not to denigrate academic research. I, I love doing academic research. It's part of my wearing a professorial hat. Do you know, Alan, how many average citations the typical academic paper receives? The the modal, the modal number. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not in that world, but you know, I hear numbers bandied about be like 100, 200, 50, okay, well, so just, five. Just I, I have no idea. Zero. Zero. Okay. So most people's academic papers get re referred to never about 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 fifth the, the modal number modal, so so okay. so okay so basically let's put it this way if you, you, you your first guesses were 100 uh, or 200 i think you said right. if you have a paper that's been cited 100 or 200 times that's a highly successful paper i mean of course it depends how many years it took to amass the 100. I mean, if it took only a year, then it's better than if it took 30 years. But already, very few papers are going to amass you know, 200 citations. As a matter of fact, if you go on Google Scholar, it gives you your I-10 index, which is how many publications have you published that have more than 10 citations? Well, why did they pick 10? Why wasn't, if it's very common to have a thousand citations, then that would have been, but that's, that would be a, like a, like a, a grand, grand slam home run. Is that it? Uh, so, so the idea is that it's very hard once you're bitten by the bug of communicating to thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people to be satisfied with only communicating with 
37 colleagues who share your interest in psychology of decision making. And again, it's not to denigrate that because you need to do that. That's part of your mandate as a professor to push the research frontier. But my God, do I also get an incredible uh, tingle when someone sends me a selfie of a copy of my book, let's say The Parasitic Mind, they're sitting on a beach you know, in Oman and they, they send me a selfie of that, right? Because that person had 1 million different possible things they could have done for that next hour or two. And yet I captivated their attention on that Oman beach. That's pretty enriching and pretty humbling. So I think that professors should be able to do it all. I don't think we should only be speaking to other ivory tower folks. And another reason why I think both of us love Thomas Sowell. In your book about happiness, you make the argument that authenticity is an important foundation for a happy life. Here's a quote from the book, quote, a central feature of personal authenticity is realness or genuineness. One is real if there is congruency between one's internal feelings and overt behaviors, even if such genuineness yields negative personal or social outcomes. When I was reading this section of your book, it occurred to me that one of the reasons I love Sowell so much, and I suspect that many other people feel this way as well, is that Sowell is just so authentic. He's so real. He speaks his mind and he doesn't seem to care how his ideas will be received. One can say the exact same thing about you actually. Tell us more about this concept of authenticity and why you believe it's such a key feature of happiness. Oh, th thank you for that fantastic question. I'll, 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 I mean, I can answer it in a, in a sort of theoretical philosophical way, or I can give you a concrete story that speaks exactly to that quote. So a few days ago, I don't know, maybe a week ago, I faced a conundrum. Okay. As often happens when you're in the public eye, there was a gentleman whom I'd never interacted with on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but who had recently come in my radar. And especially so since I'm now you know, starting to do my media tour for different shows. A lot of people said, hey, you should go on this guy's uh, show. He's got a huge following and blah, blah, blah. So I started checking him out to see, you know, who, what's this guy about? And I saw that every second, every second tweet seemed to be as though his account had been hacked by an 11-year-old prepubescent girl. Love is love through kindness and loving the flowers, we will build a society of flowers. You must cut your cucumbers with love because, you know, the cucumbers too have feelings. And at first I thought, I can't, could this be satire? Is he doing like God sad satire or is he, is he, you know, trolling? Well, no, he was spreading that message. Now it could have been either that he truly is that naive that, you know, love will conquer all or it could be that it's a false persona. So we can talk about his authenticity or lack thereof, but the more important element to your the quote from my book is, what should I do with this information? Should I swallow my tongue because there is a careerist, a pragmatic, clear benefit to me holding my tongue and going, dear so-and-so, I love what you're doing. How about I'll be coming to Texas soon. Let's get together so that I can come on your show. But that would feel false to me. Why? Because your tweets are pissing me off and they sound false and they sound inauthentic and they sound as though you're peddling pure bullshit. So, and you have a large following. So I'm getting increasingly pissed off. So then... My internal state has to be consistent with my overt behavior. I put out a sad truth clip. I'm not frivolously mean. I'm not insulting him in obnoxious ways, but I am being critical of his positions. Now, he had claimed, I'm always willing to learn. I'm always willing to listen. I'm always willing to exchange 
and debate people who disagree with me. Well, here comes God Saad disagreeing with you. What does he do? He blocks me. And then, of course, he got you know attacked mercilessly by people saying, you're fraudulent because you, you preach that from this side of your mouth, and then you do this from this side of the mouth. So the point of authenticity applies both to him and that I think he's being authentic, but more importantly, I had to be authentic with my genuine self, again, not to be frivolously mean, right? I'm not going after someone, uh, attacking them in a defamatory way. I'm saying, here is how I disagree with your positions. And I simply couldn't be quiet long enough to benefit from his large social platform. And sometimes I, I wonder whether I am being too authentic, whether on the inverted U curve, I haven't found my sweet spot, but then I think not because what allows me to walk tall, even though I'm hardly a tall guy, is that my sense of personhood doesn't have any glaring fractures. What you see is what you get, for better or worse, with all my qualities and all my faults. And I think that is a fundamental feature for being happy because there's nothing for you to modulate. If you're always speaking the truth, as far as you know, there's nothing, no lies for you to remember. It's a much easier way to live life. You know, I really, really agree with that. For for at least since I've been a teenager, there's one quote I came across that I've made my life's motto. It was from a guy named Werner Erhard. Have you ever heard of him? I don't think so. He said this. It was a, a seven-word quote that has always stuck with me. Be yourself and be that fully. Very perfect. And that's that's been my oh. life's motto. And I, and, I, and I'm and I'm glad to hear there's some scientific evidence that this actually leads to a happy life because it does have its costs, as you mentioned in your book. Exactly. Exactly. You know, you've talked about the career costs that you've paid because of your outspokenness. I was just going to say that. I mean, I'll give you one example, which I actually mentioned in in the book. Uh, I ended up taking out the identifying markers of that particular university, although I certainly didn't mind mentioning it, but. To, to stay consistent with that protocol, I won't mention the university. I'll simply say that it was a Southern California university where the, you might remember this passage from the book, where both the president of the university and the then chancellor of the university were gigantic fans of my work and were incredibly keen on having me join the university. Now, for me, that was a a, a wonderf wonderful news because while being Jewish, you might think the promised land is Israel. For me, the promised land is anything that is close to Newport Beach, California. Uh, and so I came close to getting that job. And then at the last second, when it was pretty much a sign and done deal, uh, apparently there were some folks who were not very happy for me to join the place. And I lost that job. Now, while I may regret the fact that I didn't get to spend the last, you know, at least decade in Southern California, I don't regret that, you know, I, if you if you ask me, hey, had you not said A, B, C, D, I could have now guaranteed you that you would have been at that job. I would have said to you, Alan, yeah, sorry, no. And and again, you know, some might say, well, you're too exacting in your code of personal conduct. I, I say, no, I, it allows me to put my head on the pillow at the end of the night and avert insomnia because I never feel as though I'm being fraudulent or a scammer or charlatan because I'm always being true to me. On the subject of authenticity, I want to ask you about the last chapter of the parasitic mind. You call the chapter Call to Action. In your book, you make the case that Western society is drowning in a flood of harmful ideas and that each of us needs to join the battle. You write this quote, Most people are too busy to notice the dangers of idea pathogens or wrongly assume that they are unimportant. The intrusion of anti-science, anti-reason, and illiberal movements occurs slowly and incrementally without many people becoming aware of the larger problem. 
Hence the slow and inexorable death of the West by a thousand cuts, end quote. So your goal in writing this chapter, I assume, was to inspire people to speak up and oppose the many crazy ideas which have taken hold nowadays. You talk about the bystander effect, how everyone assumes that someone else is speaking up so they don't have to. It's like, hey, Gad Sad is speaking up about this issue, so I don't have to. You talk about believing in your own voice, no matter how small the audience might be. You talk about how we shouldn't be afraid to judge others, how we shouldn't shy away from possibly offending others. You talk about how we should avoid virtue signaling. You talk about the honey badger and why we should be more like this creature. By the way, my nickname for you is the Manuka honey badger, the <laughs> honey badger of honey badgers. Oh my goodness, thank you. <laughs> so let's talk about this subject a bit. You make it sound so obvious and easy, but I think this is where most people get stuck. People are afraid to speak up. To me, the perfect example of this was the women's swim team at the University of Pennsylvania, my alma mater. Not a single female swimmer spoke up when a biological male joined their team and competed against them. Everyone was afraid to be the only one speaking up. It's like a reverse bystander effect. No one wants to be the only one to speak out. So everyone keeps quiet. What's going on here? And, and do we need some sort of game theory to understand why people are not speaking up? Right. Well, by the way, in excellent summary of all of the key points in that chapter. Look, there's something in economics very much related to game theory, as per your question, called the tragedy of the commons, right? The idea is that let's suppose you've got a plot of land where there is communal grazing. And if there's too much use of that land, then the land never has the opportunity to replenish itself and heal itself for, for next season and so on. So all of the 10 farmers that are using their livestock to graze the land come to a gentlemanly agreement that says, okay, guys, all of us are going to now commit for the next one year of never having our livestock graze that land. Deal? We all shake hands. But then the optimal strategy is for one of the farmers to violate it. Hopefully the other nine will be true to the agreement. And then we really all win because if only one farmer uses the you know the livestock grazes, it could still replenish itself and recover. And hopefully all the other nine will be honorable, whereas I'm not being. But of course, the tragedy of the commons is that every single one of the farmers think that, and then we're into trouble. So that's the idea of coordinating a collusion or a collective action. So What's happening in the diffusion of responsibility, I know that I should be speaking, and I know that God Saad said in his book that it is incumbent on each of us to speak, but you know, I don't want to not be invited to the cool kids party, and I don't want to not go to the cool Malibu, you know, uh, highfalutin progressive list parties, and therefore, you know, how about I, I be cowardly, and hopefully all the other people will heed his call. And then every single one thinks exactly that. And therefore we all go quietly into the abyss of infinite lunacy. And so what I try to tell people is, look, first of all, here's what you can do. Within your small sphere of influence, no one is expecting you to have the reach of Joe Rogan. Nobody's expecting you to be as erudite as Thomas Sowell. That's, that's okay. But within your small sphere, maybe you heard that your grade five uh, kid was being taught some insane things at school that you disagree with. Don't sit idly. Send a polite email to the teacher. Even if it's something as small as that, you don't even have to start a march. You don't have to start a parental uh, indignation group. Just which, in whichever way that you can, you could affect change. Some of us can affect it on a huge soapbox. Some of us have very small voices. Just don't diffuse the responsibility onto others. And to... To, to the honey badger point, the reason why I specifically chose the honey badger, because for those listeners of yours who don't know much about the honey badger, it has been officially, formally ranked as the fiercest animal in the animal kingdom. I mean, it is just unimaginably fierce, right? It can withstand the sting of a thousand bees. It could be stung by an incredibly venomous uh, snake. 
and it passes out and then rebounds. It could be attacked by six adult lions. The reason why I say six is because there are YouTube footages where you literally see six adult lions shying away from an insane uh, honey badger. Now, the honey badger is the size of a small dog. So it's not as though it is ferocious by its size. It's ferocious in its attitude, right? It's ferocious in its I don't give an F mindset. And so what I tell people when I implore them to activate their inner honey badger, it's not that they should be physically violent, but be ideologically fierce. If you truly believe that there are clear definitions of what it means to be male or female, as have 117 billion people who have existed since the start of Homo sapiens, we all seem to have known exactly what male or female was until three minutes ago when someone at Oberlin College told us that we were all simpletons. But I seem to have married a person that seemed to have the right genitalia for us to bear children, as you seem to have also. What an incredible coincidence, 117 billion people. So if you find that it is insane and it stretches your credulity to hear such nonsense, challenge your politician, challenge your uh, principal at your kid's school. Challenge your friend on Facebook. Just get engaged. And if we all of us speak in unison, I I, I famously said on the, the first time that I appeared on uh, Tucker Carlson's night show, I, I say famously because he started laughing when I said, I said, look, if we all speak in unison, we will get rid of these problems by next Tuesday. If we don't, it will be a slow train ride to hell, right? Activate your inner honey badger. That's really what it is. It's a it's a challenge of, of coordinating the collective action. If we're able to do that, I think all this nonsense could be eradicated very quickly. You're right, but you know, I, I just want to challenge you on one thing, though. You know, some sure. people are able to speak up and monetize their speaking up. You know, you mentioned Tucker Carlson; he can he has monetized speaking up. Megan Kelly has monetized speaking up. Um, you've been able to monetize speaking up to some extent with your books and and YouTube, you know, and all that. Um, but most people will never be able to monetize speaking up. In fact, it's going to cost them real money. You know, if you have to pay your mortgage every month and you got to go to Costco and you got to pay the groceries and your insurance and your cell phone bill and you know, all that, I mean, you've got real bills to pay. If simply the fear of losing your job or of losing a client, that would be enough to shut you up. How does one break out of that monetary fear? Yes. So no, that's a great question. And there are several ways I can answer it. I can answer it first. And I, I'm not trying to be bombastic uh, or, you know, hyperbolic. June 6th just happened recently. June 6th, you know, landing on D-Day. 18, 19-year-old men, all of whom said, oh, I'll go, I'll go. And they landed knowing that they were going to be mowed down like little insignificant mosquitoes. Yet they said, oh, yeah, sign me up for that. I'll do it. So why am I saying that? Because I'm contextualizing the fear that people fear today, which you're mentioning is a, is a real fear. Yes, I'm not, I'm not belittling the fact that you don't want to lose your job and not be able to pay your mortgage, but that there is nothing that is worth fighting for as, as grand as freedom of speech, as defense of reality, uh, that doesn't involve some cost. Now, I'm not suggesting that people be reckless martyrs, right? Which, by the way, speaks to, in one of the chapters of my forthcoming happiness book, I have a whole chapter on the inverted you. Too little of something is not good. Too much of something is not good. And for almost every phenomenon that you could think of, there is a middle sweet spot, which Aristotle had talked about you know, 2,000 years ago. It's not good to be a cowardly, meek soldier it's not good to be a reckless martyr who jumps and takes unnecessary risks because you're going to die very quickly as a soldier. But somewhere in the middle lies the golden meat, the sweet spot. So this is where I implore people to use whatever cost-benefit, risk-reward calculus in deciding how they wish to involve themselves in the battle of ideas. 
but do it in some form. So for example, you're too afraid to go publicly on Twitter because maybe your boss is going to fire you, although that itself should get you pissed off that in a free society in the 21st century, you can't do that. But okay, you want to be pragmatic and you you want to be able to pay the groceries for your kids. How about you just challenge your friend privately when you're sitting at a pub when they say something that strikes you as insane? In other words, there are many ways by which we could lend our voice in the battle of ideas while not necessarily taking any unnecessary risks. And I should also mention that the, the costs of speaking out are hardly only monetary, right? Because you could, for example, argue, as I explain in the parasitic mind, some people will write to me and say, yes, professor, sure, you're courageous, but you're a tenured professor, you can't be fired, okay? And then I usually write back to them and say, can you send me your home address so I can redirect all of the death threats I receive straight to your home? Because it doesn't seem as though tenure is protecting me when I'm looking left, right, and center everywhere to make sure that I'm not getting knifed in the next five minutes. There was a time when I would go into my university classes to lecture where I, I had received many, many death threats that caused the police to be involved and so on, where at the end of my lecture, as I would be whisked back into the waiting car for me to go back home, I would have something akin to like an anxiety thing because I survived another week until next week's class without being knifed or killed somewhere because I didn't know if they were coming for me or not. So we all have a cost to bear. Uh, Boo-hoo-hoo about your concerns. I'm not trying to be uh, minimizing, but the reality is, what about what I went through as a child in Lebanon? How does that compare to your fears? So the only way you could live in an enlightened, free, civil society is if we all put in the costs necessary to protect the deontological principles that allow that society to flourish. So no, I'm not going to shed a tear for you because you have a mortgage to pay. I also have a life to live and I had a panic attack two years ago because of the death threats I was receiving. And yet here I am talking to Alan. So no, I don't feel sorry for you, speak up. segue from this heavy topic to humor. One of the things I love about you is that you make me laugh a lot. In your new book about happiness, you describe humor as an important component of a happy life. When I read this, I was reminded that one of the things I love about Thomas Sowell is his incredible sense of humor. As you know, I collect Sowell quotes, and almost all of them are funny in one way or another. Gad, would you like to play a quick game with me right now? Go. Okay. I know you like to play. So I'm going to share my screen with you. And I've collect, I put together 34 funny Thomas Sowell quotes. Let me open this up. Here we go. Can you see that? Uh, I just see like file name, like one okay, to yes. 34. Yes. yes. Here, here's the game. Pick a number. Pick a card, any card. Pick a number one through 34. Here are the 34 quotes I've collected and I'll open it. Oh, I like it. 13. Okay. So this this proves to the audience that this is a total random selection. So why don't you why don't you read it for the audience? Sure. Take away the spirit impact theory, and you would have widespread unemployment in government agencies that enforce anti-discrimination laws. Trial lawyers might have so much time on their hands that they would have to sue more doctors <laughs> in order to make ends meet. Right. By the way, do you know why I chose number 13? Because that happens to be my birthday. Oh, okay. October 13th. Yes. Okay. Red. Okay. So 
this is one of Thomas Sowell's funny quotes that, you know, I just, I did an episode recently about disparate impact theory and, you know, how if, if some policies have a disparate impact on certain racial groups, that those policies are de facto uh, racist, racist. Yeah. you know, and that there, there could be any real differences between different groups. It has to be the policies that make the differences. Uh, and, he, you know, and he was saying that, you know, if they if they got rid of disparate impact theory, that these trial lawyers would have so much time on their hands that they would have to sue more doctors in order to make ends meet. And I know you laughed when you read it, but what 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 do you what do you make of this type of Sowellian humor, as I call it? You know, how do you describe this type of humor? Well, it's it's highbrow humor, right? Because th th there's a lot to dissect and process for you to be able to get to sort of the humorous nugget right uh, which is perfectly fine i mean i that's great that's that's fine i'm not sure that the average person and i and i don't mean that in an elitist sense i'm just being pragmatic you know because then they might say well what wait a minute i don't even understand what disparate impact theory might mean and i don't even right so to put it all together to understand then the punchline might require quite a bit of cognitive load so i might <laughs> argue that while that is a perfectly reasonable approach to humor. Satire, which I use very often, which some might say is itself quite impenetrable, unless you're quite intelligent. I find that to be an even more punchy form of uh, humor. And by the way, that's why you may know that satirists are arguably the most despised people that every autocrat wants to get rid of first. Because the autocrat and the ideologue is not worried about the guys with the big muscles. They're worried about the guys with the sharp tongues and the stingy pen. And satire is really akin to the surgeon's scalpel. So, so I might have a slightly different uh, comedic style, but I certainly appreciate that quote. Okay. Want to pick another one? Okay. Let me put back my glasses. Uh, let's go with... 22. Let's face it, most of us are not half as smart as we may sometimes think we are. And for intellectuals, not one tenth as smart. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's funny that you said that because you, I don't know if you uh, if you saw it in the parasitic mind. I, I was kind of channeling my inner George Orwell when mm -hmm. I'm talking about idea pathogens, uh, which all of these idea pathogens regrettably were spawned on university campuses and i say it takes intellectuals to uniquely come up with some of the dumbest ideas and that's actually one of the places where i i think i appreciate from the five percent of material that i've read of thomas sowell he seems to have a uh, disdain for the highfalutin progressive list on anointed ones and i exactly share in that sentiment and by the way, to your earlier question, because many of them reek of falsity, reek of inauthenticity, right? Part of my humor is actually a manifestation, and now I'm linking the different threads of your questions, is a manifestation of my authenticity. And some of my, quote, lowbrow humor I mean, I'm not doing farting jokes, but you know, when I hide under the, the desk in, in, in full fear, I'm not doing uh, the fancy disparate impact theory, right? But that, if I may say, requires a very unique comedic talent and an incredible, if I may speak of myself, sense of confidence. Because why? Some would say, oh, you're losing your serious, austere professorial aura when you hide under the desk. You're no longer appearing professorial when you wear that pink wig when I went to Ithaca and I came back from Ithaca more woke than ever, and therefore I changed my hairstyle. On the contrary, it reeks of authenticity. It reeks of my desire to approach life as a playground, one of the chapters in the book, which is I can perfectly be the very serious professor that you saw me when I spoke at the Stanford Academic Freedom Conference, and then the next day be wearing a pink wig while hiding under the desk. That's called being a multifaceted, multidimensional human being. And regrettably, most academics don't have the sense, the strong sense of personhood to think that they can pull off 
the multiple facets of their selves. So they always have to be looking up into the sky, pontificating deeply. They're not being real. That's what I love about Thomas Sowell. He's real. Nobody does it better. Makes me feel sad. Let's talk a little bit about creativity as a component of happiness. You mentioned in your new book that the physicist Richard Feynman was an ardent bongo drummer, which I didn't know. And that the classicist Victor Davis Hanson, who's one of my intellectual heroes, that he's also a, a a farmer. Yes. And you mentioned that Thomas Sowell is a passionate photographer, which I think a lot of my listeners might not even know. You can actually see his photos at tsowell.com. That's his own personal website, if you're curious. Tell us why some type of creativity is so vital for happiness. And let me mention that for me, podcasting has developed into exactly the kind of creative outlet you were talking about. Look, you and I right now are involved in a tangle. This it's an intellectual tangle. It's a conversational tangle. You ask a question, it takes me to certain places, you rebut, we're dancing. We're doing an intellectual dance. That dance will be recorded and people will listen to it and hopefully will appreciate it. That did not exist before you reached out and said, hey, let's dance together. So you are engaged in the creative process. So I completely get what you're saying about the creativity. Now let's step back and answer your broader question. Uh, When I was talking about the creative impulse as a route to happiness, it was in the context of one of the early chapters in the book where I'm talking about the two most important decisions that will either impart the greatest amount of happiness upon you or the greatest amount of misery. And that is hopefully choosing the rights, exactly that one, choosing the right spouse, uh, you know, wisely, judiciously, and choosing the right profession. Now, you might say, well, how can we ever know? Well, you could never know, but there are certainly some clear guidelines that augment the probability that you're making a right choice, right? Life is is about navigating through statistical minefields, right? And so in the context of choosing the right profession, I argue that the professions that are most likely to impart the greatest amount of purpose and meaning to you, all other things equal, are those that allow you to instantiate your creative impulse. But now here's the kicker. I define the creative impulse very, very broadly. So you could be a chef and you could adhering to what I'm saying, right? You are creating a small little sensorial experience, which until you came along and created, those patrons had never experienced before. You could be an architect and be involved in the creative process. You can be a professor or an author, right? I mean, I'm always amazed how the book that you just read that I sent you, well, I guess you read two books, but the latest one, there was a day when I opened my laptop, I opened the Word document, and there wasn't a single letter written. And then 12, 14 months later, it goes to the publisher. And then a while later, here's Alan reading that book and hopefully enjoying it. That's a mystical experience, that creative process. So whether you are a journalist writing an investigative piece or whether you are an artist creating a new painting or a chef or an architect or an author, anything that allows you to instantiate your creative impulse has to lead to greater uh, purpose and meaning. Now, then someone could ask, but okay, what, but what if I am an insurance adjuster? Well, what does that mean? I'm, I'm, I'm doomed to unhappiness? Well, no. We, we, of course, need all sorts of people who are not necessarily the creative types, but you could still then instantiate your creative impulse by choosing hobbies that cater to that, right? So I may have decided to become a pediatrician because my dad was a pediatrician and his dad was a pediatrician. I've always wanted to be a ceramics artist, but it wasn't seen nicely in my uh, Jewish community to be anything but a pediatrician. But how about when I finish my rounds at the hospital, children's hospital, instead of going home and watching mindless television for three hours, why don't I sign up for the ceramics class 
in the Lifelong Learning Institute where I might instantiate that creativity. So I think anything that allows you to tickle that creative reflex is guaranteed to get you closer to happiness. I've been here before But always hit the floor I've spent a lifetime running And I always get away But with you I'm feeling something That makes me want to stay I'm prepared for this Let's end our conversation for today on the subject of marriage. You mention in your new book, the 1993 movie, A Bronx Tale. You mentioned it twice. My last episode was called Love and Marriage. So my mind is very much in tune on this subject right now. Tell us why marriage is so important for happiness and what lesson you learned from A Bronx Tale that everyone should take to heart. Oh, love it. So let me let me answer your, the first part of your question uh, using uh, you know my evolutionary hat. Humans are in a sense in a evolutionary conundrum because we have both evolved the conflicting desire of long-term coupling because we are a biparental species by by definition compared to other mammalian species human dads are super dads we are by far one of the most invested mammalian dads of of all mammals but by far okay we may not invest as much as women on average but we are certainly considered to be a biparental species therefore it makes perfect evolutionary sense for the mechanisms, for example, the affiliative, the emotional system of ro- ro- romantic love to have evolved because it needs to keep us bonded long enough to invest in our children until they reach sexual maturity. So on the one hand, it is perfectly natural for there to be long-term unions as per a marriage. On the other hand, as I explain in a later chapter when I talk about variety seeking, uh, we've also paradoxically evolved the desire <laughs> for uh, for those of you who are only listening to this, Alan put his hand on his ears as though he's feigning. He doesn't want to hear this. We've also evolved the desire to stray. And so it's always this multiple Darwinian tugs that are pulling us in different directions. But all other things considered, my God, is it more enjoyable to uh, be able to share your life with someone. Uh, imagine now when the the denouement of my book coming out now was something that I can't share with anybody. But imagine when I see my 11-year-old going to the cafe with me and he's trying to struggle as he's reading chapter one of my book and he asks me, what does heterogeneous mean? But he doesn't pronounce it right. And then my wife comes to me and I actually had her on camera the second that she finished reading the book and she started tearing up because she was sad that now she had read, she had finally read the book and now she doesn't have the anticipation of wondering what's to come. It's been consumed. I can't imagine feeling the same sense of uh, excitement if I couldn't share that with my children and wife, but uh, to your second, so, so all other things equal, I think that uh, long-term coupling to use the evolutionary term or marriage is certainly correlated to happiness, although I could completely understand that some people decide not to. But to the the Bronx Tale question, uh, so there I took a snippet from the movie called The The Door Test, where the the young man is about to go out on a date with a young uh, woman, they're they're in high school, and his mentor, who's this kind of local mafia boss, tells him, when you take her out, make sure that she passes the door test. I'm I'm paraphrasing the exact words. And the guy says, what is the door test? He said, well, so this is, the movie's taking place in the 60s where you don't have an automatic, uh, you know, opener of the car, of the car door. Uh, He says, you first open her door, then you come around the car and you wait to see if as you're coming around, she moves, she moves to open your car door. If she does, that means she is considerate. She's not only thinking of herself, and then you know that she's a keeper. And then, of course, she passes the door test. Now, I explain this in the book 
And then I say, well, let me tell you about my door test. Although it was kind of a serendipitous tea test, tea, what you drink. So the way that I, I met my wife uh, when I was giving some uh, in-house executive education at a company, I, I had been mandated to teach, I think it was six weeks of material to the executives of this, this telemarketing firm. You know, one week it might be psychology decision-making, one week it might be advertising, consumer behavior, whatever. Around maybe the third class, I had contracted, as I have in the past, often a really bad bronchitis. And I used to be asthmatic. And so when I, when I get bronchitis, I have this really nasty kind of whooping cough. I'm like really miserable, but of course I don't want to miss class. So I was struggling to try to get through this. I think it was like a three hour lecture. And about halfway through the lecture, I called for a break where you know people went and got lunch or whatever. And unbeknownst to me, without my having done anything, uh, my wife-to-be went downstairs, went to a, whatever place to get a tea, brought it back to me and said, you, you know, you seem to, to be struggling, breathing. Hopefully this can help you. And, you know, I was uh, more mesmerized by that kind, considerate act than her beauty. And she is very beautiful. Uh, but that was inconsequential compared to someone who had the 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 gentle consideration to do something like that. So that was my door test. And so the reason I mention all these things in the book is I say, you know, we have to be attuned to these important cues when we're choosing a partner. Uh, you know, lust is nice, but we know that these things fluctuate in very predictable ways. But if you have someone who is structurally on the inside, a high quality individual, that you take forever. So choose wisely. Yeah, you call it consideration. I call it nurturing. That's how I look at it. I, you know, I was looking for someone that I thought was a nurturing woman. And I, I like you, I've been very lucky to have found that the most wonderful wife I could imagine. And maybe one day you'll meet her. I would be delighted to. Next visit to Southern California. Indeed, which I'll be coming, by the way, uh, in August, uh, because I'm first going to be speaking. Do you know what the Commonwealth Book Club is? No, I don't. It's. I mean, I didn't know what it was, but I subsequently have found out that apparently it's a pretty big deal. It's in San Francisco. So first, I'll be going there to do an event uh, in, in celebration of the release of the book. And then I'll be going down to Southern California where I'll be doing a whole bunch of shows there. So maybe we'll have an opportunity to meet them. Yeah, if you come to Los Angeles, I would love to meet you. That'd be great. Gad Sad, thank you for joining me on the Genius of Thomas Sowell podcast. Thank you so much. It's been a delight and thank you for inviting me. This has been episode 33 of the Genius of Thomas Sowell podcast. If you want to support the work we are doing, introducing more and more people to the ideas of Thomas Sowell, there are many ways you can help. Rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts. Tell your friends about Sowell and the podcast. Support us on Patreon. Purchase our Thomas Sowell post-it notes. Follow me on Twitter for daily solo quotes and to connect with other fans of You Know Who. For now, just sit back and enjoy this orchestral version of No Time to Die, created by Epic Orchestra. I'm Alan Wolin. Thanks for listening.